Greetings, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar program. My name is Joshua Furman. I'm the Associate Director of the Program in Jewish Studies at Rice University and the curator of the Joan and Stanford Alexander South Texas Jewish Archives. Today's program is being recorded and it'll be made available on the Rice Humanities YouTube channel shortly. I want to remind everyone that questions for our speaker today can be submitted using the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen. And we hope to be able to cover some of them at the end of today's program. Now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Kirsten Vermeglish, who will give a presentation that will be followed by discussion and your questions. Kirsten Vermeglish is Professor of History and Jewish Studies at Michigan State University. Her most recent book, A Rosenberg by Any Other Name, a History of Jewish Name-Changing in America, NYU Press 2018, was awarded the Saul Wiener Book Prize by the American Jewish Historical Society in June of 2019. Vermeglish is also the author of American Dreams and Nazi Nightmares, Early Holocaust Consciousness and Liberal America, 1957 to 1965, which was published by Brandeis University Press in 2006, and she is the co-editor of the Norton Critical Edition of Betty Friedan, The Feminine Mystique, uh, which was published in 2013 with Lisa Fine. From 2016 to 2021, she was co-editor of the journal American Jewish History alongside Daniel Sawyer and Adam Mendelson. She is currently pursuing two research projects. One looks at anti-Semitism in the federal government and the other focuses on the migration of Jewish academics to college towns throughout the South and Midwest in the years after World War II. Please join me in welcoming Professor Fermeglish. Thank you so much, Josh. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you to John Waterhouse and Chad Cates for facilitating this. And thank you to everyone who's here in the audience. Um, I really am excited to be able to speak with you. And thank you so much for, for giving me this opportunity. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you so I can begin to um, offer my presentation, which I'll do right there. Um, so usually when I start, I mean, now this has become, you know, virtual, virtual presentations are everywhere. When I first started um, uh, giving my lectures, I was in person. Um, and I would usually ask people in the audience, you know, to raise their hand if they had a name changing story in their, you know, family, and I'd get, you know, a decent handful of people. And then I'd say, and how many people have a friend or know someone in their community who changed their names, and then more people. And then I'd say, how many people have read a book? Or a, you know, seen a movie that features a name changer, and you know, by the end, hopefully, most generally, most people in the audience are raising their hand. Um, name changing is just an integral part of American Jewish culture and history, um, and American culture more broadly. Um, there are anecdotes and anecdotes, excuse me, and jokes and folklore about name changing throughout American and American Jewish life. Um, and I think that those um, jokes and anecdotes have really shaped our cultural understanding of what it means to change your name. So I like to start talks just by talking about some of those anecdotes and jokes, kind of getting them out into the, into, into the air. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to consider three different images. Um, the first is um, the first story comes from Edward G. Robinson's memoir, All My Yesterdays. Um, an immigrant from Bucharest, Romania, Robinson changed his name from Emanuel Goldenberg when he was an 18-year-old drama student. <clears throat> um, and he says in his memoir, he changed it when, quote, it was suggested to me ever so tactfully that Emanuel Goldenberg was not a name for an actor. Too long, too foreign, and I suspect too Jewish. And he says, although, quote, the thought of changing it was unpleasant, um, somehow a denial of my beginning, somehow unfaithful to my mother and father and five brothers. He searched for a new American sounding name and adopted his middle initial G as, quote, my private treaty with the past. Um, the second story um, is actually a very famous joke. When, again, when I used to do this in person, I would tell the beginning of the joke and everyone would finish it for me. So see if you can do this 
back home in the comfort of your own home. Um, a Jewish immigrant comes to America um, at Ellis Island and he's processed according to the standard procedures and they are very confusing to him. He's overwhelmed by the noise and the bustle. And so when one of the officials asks him, what is your name? He replies, Shane Ferguson in Yiddish, I've already forgotten. And the official then recorded his name as Sean Ferguson or Shane Ferguson. Um, and then finally, the third story is a scene from the popular film Hester Street, um, which was a dramatization of the Abraham Kahan novel Yackel. I usually ask if people have seen this, you know, usually people, especially in an older audience, a lot of people have seen this movie. It was quite popular, won an Academy Award um, for the actress, Carol Kane, who's featured here. Um, the story of Yackel is that of an immigrant who has been in the country for several years and has tried to shed his old world roots completely. Um, he calls himself Jake. He prides himself on his Yankee clothes and his knowledge of American culture and his ability to speak English. Um, but on the death of his father, he has to send for his wife, um, Giddle, played by Carol Kane here, as well as his son. But even bringing them over, he is embarrassed of their greenhorn status, um, and he shuns his wife for a beautiful, more assimilated woman. Um, and his wife, Giddle, as you can see in this image, um, feels rejected and confused, and the name change becomes kind of the symbol of the distance between them um, and sort of the ways that he is, is rejecting her and leaving her behind. So I usually say, I don't, I don't know if you know these specific stories, but Probably at least one or two of them sound familiar to you. Certainly movie star changing, movie stars changing names is something pretty much everybody has access to. Um, and although the stories are, you know, quite, quite different, um, uh, they actually share one similarity that I really like to point out to people. Um, they all emphasize name changing as a profoundly individual activity. Um, and I have to say, I went into the archives um, with these images in my head and kind of anticipating that that's what this would be, that I'd find lots of stories of individuals, right? In the case of, of um, uh, Edward G. Robinson and all movie star name changes, the name change is an act of an extraordinary individual distinguished by talent or beauty or charisma kind of being elevated to a Hollywood pantheon and kind of leaving the normal world of, of ordinary human beings behind, right? And certainly their families, as he describes very beautifully in his memoir. Um, immigrant Sean Ferguson's name change, on the other hand, um, was the result of his profound isolation. His name was changed because he was a lonely individual and had no understanding of or connections to his new culture and he had no one to help him in navigating the system. And then finally, in Hester Street, name changing is identified with a shallow young man who wants to abandon his family and his roots um, and to remake himself entirely in the new world. All three of these stories, I think, suggest that name changing was an act entered into by individuals who were isolated or escaping from or betraying Jewish families or the Jewish community. Um, and again, that's kind of what I expected when I went into the archives. It was definitely the narrative that I realized kind of unconsciously shaped how I imagined things were going to go. Um, so I found what I found was more surprising to me. Um, you know, I'm going to offer you here a less famous image of name changing. Um, uh, this is the, in 1932, a man named Max Greenberger petitioned the city court of the city of New York to allow himself, as well as two of his four children, to change their last name to Green. Um, one of Greenberger's grounds for this petition was that the name Greenberger is a foreign sounding name and is not conducive to securing good employment as a musician, which was the chosen profession of his daughter. Another ground was that the name Greenberger is not helpful towards securing an appointment as intern in a hospital, the chosen profession of one of his sons. Um, Greenberger's petition was one of thousands that was submitted in the middle of the 20th century to the New York City Civil Court. Um, men, women, and children like the Greenbergers legally changed their ethnic sounding names to less ethnically identifiable ones really between 19 teens um, and the 1960s. Um, and until the 1960s, Jewish names were, were represented disproportionately among name changers in New York City. Um, but historians really haven't looked at this very much. They've kind of allowed this kind of, these narratives to kind of flourish and nobody before me had really studied these uh, these um, petitions. Um, and so what I'm gonna do for you is really sort of talk about the realities of what I found in the archives um, and, and really kind of argue that I think that this 
helps us to better understand American Jewish life. We can, we can understand a lot more about what American Jews were facing, what they experienced, um, and their decisions and how those decisions shaped American Jewish culture and American Jewish community. Um, so I'm going to argue for you, you can see here in the shadows, one of the things that I think is important to maintain is something that we see in this Greenberger file really well, is that name changing was a family activity, far from my kind of vision that you were or are and all these cultural images of this one person, you know, getting rid of their family, we can see from Max Greenberger, he's taken his family along. Um, and there are hundreds, thousands of petitions that look just like this one. Um, I'll say also that the strategy illustrates Jews' economic um, strength um, and comfort in the United States. The Greenberger children were not searching for manual labor, um, uh, right? They were looking for nice middle-class jobs. Um, but it also illustrates Jewish weakness. Um, an identifiable Jewish name, as Greenberger says here, was not helpful to securing good employment. Um, so what I sort of argue in the book um, is, and what I'll give you a little bit of a taste of today, um, and I'm happy to talk more about in Q&A, is that name changing was a strategy that enabled Jews and particularly Jewish families to attain and strengthen a position in the American middle class. But there were costs to that, and it, it really reflected some of the difficulties that Jews were facing in the United States at the time. Um, so let me briefly, and I can, I'm happy to talk more about it in Q&A, let me just briefly let you know what I looked at so you can have a sense of where I was. So the petition that I just showed you was one of thousands that I looked at um, in New York City. So this it did have a New York City focused. I looked at the name change petitions in New York City Civil Court for more than a century, 1887 to 2012. Um, I'm happy to talk more about the methodology. I have some fun stories from the archives. Um, you know, I'm I'm happy to talk more about how I how I did this work because I think it's important to understand. And also, since I know this is um, a, a Texas audience, it also is important to talk about the fact that it was New York City. And I'm happy to talk more about either why I selected New York City or how how representative I think it is or is not of other other places in the country. Um, and one other thing that I want to sort of um, make clear that I think is something that audiences typically expect or think that maybe I'll be talking about um, is Ellis Island um, and the degree to which people's names were changed at Ellis Island. People frequently have a story in their family about names being changed at Ellis Island. Um, and um, what I'll say about that is that in general, most genealogists, most historians argue that this, that, you know, sort of the mass involuntary name changing um, that that you know we we sort of see in the joke of Sean Ferguson that that kind of um, name changing never happened. Um, there's a, you know a good deal of reasons why people think people argue this. Ellis Island officials did not write down names individually. So what you can see here, if you do any genealogy in your family, this is a ship manifest. Um, you can see it's all a continuous um, uh, um, uh, handwriting. This was this was filled out um, at the point of debarking at the point of um, debarkation in Europe. Um, Ellis Island officials did not write people's names down. They checked their names against manifests. They did not leave Ellis Island with any paperwork that bound them to a new name. American law gave no power at all to inspectors to determine individuals' names. So while it's possible that there were maybe a rogue inspector here or there who maybe suggested suggested to somebody, ah, that's a crappy name, get a new name. In general, there's no systematic, um, there's no evidence of systematic, systemic, large scale, involuntary name changing in Ellis Island. Instead, what there is, is the voluntary name changing that we can find in name change petitions, which is why that's where I centered my research. Um, but I'm happy to talk more about this after in the Q&A, so please feel free. Okay, so um, uh, what I'm going to do mostly is talk about what I see as really a rise of name changing, and I gave these dates. So the dates that I'm, you know, uh, that I see sort of Jews really being disproportionate begin in 1917, and they really swell in the 1940s. I really see this as kind of like a rise of really a phenomenon of name changing. Um, so. During the years um, between World War I and World War II, the years that I'm going to focus on in this talk, New Yorkers began to file name change petitions in numbers that were double, triple, and ultimately quadruple those before the wars. Um, and, you know, 
you, you might ask, you might want to know, certainly as an historian, I want to know this, you know, I walked into the, I walked into this archive and actually showed me the room where all these boxes are. And there's just tons and tons of them. And most of them are centered in these years, um, uh, particularly early on. And why is this? I mean, this was one of the key questions I wanted to know. So official name changing is a byproduct of the growth of a modern state. Um, so immigrant memoirs, immigrants actually, far from being changed to Ellis Island, immigrants change their names on their own. If you read any immigrant memoirs, people change their names at the drop of a hat. You know, they go into a sweatshop and someone says, ah, oh, that's not a great name. You know, Ruth, why don't you change your name to Rose? That's much prettier, right? And people would just change that. Um, uh, there is unofficial name changing um, throughout immigrant history. Immigrants choose new names quickly without a second thought at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, as a growing government bureaucracy emerged in the 19, in the 20th century, excuse me, um, uh, this bureaucracy began to track individuals who needed to pay taxes, who needed to serve in the military, um, who needed to maybe work in a defense plant, who needed to receive welfare benefits. The growth of these kinds of activities on the part of the government led to more bureaucracy, where the government began to say, well, why, why do you have this unofficial name? that you took on, right? What's what's the name that was really on your birth certificate? What's the name that, you know, you have on all your other documents? Um, so it's not surprising then that these years see this huge groundswell, you know, as we see the growth of a welfare state and two major world wars um, where the government is, is drafting men and putting them into practice in, into war. It's not surprising that we would see this, this massive growth of, of name changing during this time. And we can see this reflected in the petitions. Um, what I didn't expect to see, to be honest, um, you know, so there's, there's a push for just people in general to be changing their names. I didn't, even though I'm an American Jewish historian, I'm also an American historian, and I didn't necessarily assume that this was going to be just a Jewish practice. And it wasn't. There are Italians and Poles, people from all over who changed their names. But it is really striking that Jews were overwhelmingly and disproportionately represented in the petitions. Um, so, you know, the numbers of Jew Jewish petitioners during these years can fluctuate, you know, 50, 60 percent. Um, and if you account for the fact that most of these name changers lived in Manhattan, the numbers of Jews who live in Manhattan is about 14 to 17 percent um, at this time, right? So Jews are well overrepresented, um, even, even given the fact that they are about 25 to 30 percent of the New York population for the entire, um, for the for all Bronx boroughs, for all the boroughs. Nonetheless, it's really striking that Jews are there in much larger numbers, in the petition in much larger numbers than their presence in the city. Um, in 1942, the total number of petitions submitted by people with Slavic, German, Italian, and Greek surnames altogether was less than a half of the Jews who were seeking to erase their names for, for these kinds of purposes. So it's, it's really pretty striking. Um, and then, so knowing that, and again, I didn't expect to see that, but it also sort of asked the question, why, right? Why are Jews there in such high numbers? Um, and I would argue that one reason that they're there is that they were more upwardly mobile. Um, they, they were moving into the middle class in these years in larger numbers. Um, so let me explain why that middle class mobility helps to explain why Jews are, are so, um, so, so, so well represented. So New York state law in the middle of the 20th century, just like today, made clear that you didn't have to file legal papers in order to change your name, right? You can unofficially change your name. So it's only if you're concerned that somebody might be checking your name that they're going to be that they're going to be looking at you that you might want to change your name officially and it's mostly at this time middle class people who are most concerned about that um it's expensive to change your name officially so not everybody has access to that those ma funds it costs money to file a petition to hire a lawyer to put an announcement in the newspaper advertising the change which was a requirement of the law but more subtly and more significantly, in the first half of the 20th century, it's mostly white collar workers and businessmen who worry that somebody might be scrutinizing their names. If you were a working class person, you probably got your job through word of mouth, brother, got you a job in the union or at the factory. 
if you're a domestic servant, same thing. Or for both of these jobs, you might go stand on a street corner and have people inspect your bodies. You're not getting jobs by putting your name on an application form. But Jews, um, middle-class people, are doing that. They are applying to go to college. They are applying to go to professional schools. And they are business people, right? Or they are looking to get jobs as clerks, typists, stenographers, um, any kind of middle-class job. They are the ones who have to put their names down in paper. And so they are the ones who recognize that their names can, can lead to discrimination. So Jews' unusual position among recent immigrants, um, having moved in large numbers from blue-collar to white-collar work, find themselves the recent, the recent immigrant group with the most money available for filing name change petitions and the most concerned about what their names look like on paper. So they are really, because of this upward mobility and a desire to continue this upward mobility, they are the ones who really are concerned with what their names look like, and they're going to be the ones to file these petitions. At the same time, however, um, it, 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 it seems pretty clear as well that anti-Semitism um, plays a role, right? They are concerned about what their names look like on paper because their Jewish sounding names don't look good on paper, because they are facing discrimination because of these Jewish sounding names. Um, as more Jews entered white collar work, they found increasing barriers to their employment. Um, according to one 1937 report, 89% of large New York companies declared that they preferred Christians as employees. Um, and you can see here, this is from the New York world in 1931. You can see that this help wanted ad is calling for Protestants to be status statisticians, guards to be Christian, floormen to be Christian, right? This is legal at the time to be able to advertise like this. And so people do, and Jews are, employers are substantially using names as markers um, to identify and exclude Jews. So there are reports in the 1930s that employment agencies and employers are regularly turning away individuals with Jewish names. Um, the same thing is happening on college applications. I don't have an image of this, but I'm happy to talk more about that in Q&A. College applications go through a major change at this point where they begin to scrutinize names as well as a whole host of other factors to try to exclude Jews from colleges. Um, so let me give you, you know, so we can see this from petitioners as we look in the, in the files. So, and I have thousands of these, but I just am giving you one. A woman, a stenographer named Dora Sarietsky in 1937 petitioned um, to change her name to Doris Watson. Um, she describes actually 20 years of, how, or excuse me, she, she describes several years, um, quite, a, quite a number, having used the work Doris Watson um, because she realized that over the course of a long period, the name Dora Sarietsky was not getting her a name. So she assumed another name and got the job and she is now looking to make it permanent. Um, and you see this over and over again in many of the petitions. Um, even non-Jewish petitioners, and this is an interesting story. So people like Dora Sarietsky usually used veiled language, like talking about um, being foreign, um, having a name that sounded foreign or difficult to spell and pronounce. They rarely explicitly said that it was anti-Semitism, although like Dora Sarietsky, they described years of searching for jobs and not finding them. Um, the only petitions that I found where people actually indicated that they were having trouble finding um, work because of their names were actually from, excuse me, because they had Jewish names, actually came from non-Jewish petitioners. So Oh, sorry, excuse me. So Julius Kaminsky in 1932, um, I testified that he was a Catholic man um, and said, while petitioner has highest of respect for people of the Jewish race, um, he finds that other people in the city of New York have not that respect, uh, that a good many employers under whom he has worked um, uh, have discriminated against the Jewish race. Right. So Catholics are quite comfortable. Right. And I have at least one other petition that says something very similar from another Catholic man with a Jewish sounding name, um, you know, they are comfortable saying that they've experienced anti-Semitism. The Jews themselves are not, but the degree to which they are describing themselves like Dora Sarietsky, not able to find work, not able to get into schools, experiencing embarrassment or humiliation from um, coworkers or clients or things like that, makes it clear that 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 is what is going on. People are not finding work, they are not getting into schools, and they think that they're that their names are, are playing a major role in this. 
Um, so the numbers go up in the 1920s and the 1930s, but they skyrocket in the 1940s. So I'm just giving you this image to see. You can see that 1942 and then again, 1946, which doesn't show up on this graph, have the highest numbers of petitions in the entire 20th century. Um, it's, 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 it's quite dramatic. Um, World War II really intensified um, the trends of name changing. Um, uh, and um, and actually, I'll move this forward. So again, we can ask why? Why is this? Why why do we see this? Um, and one reason I would say is to repeat what I said in the earlier period in the twenties and thirties. Bureaucracy is expanding. Um, the government is growing. Defense plants begin requiring people to say, um, excuse me, to provide a birth certificate um, and make sure that their documents match their birth certificate. So you see just, you know, hundreds, hundreds, thousands of people saying, you know, my birth certificate doesn't match. I need to change my name because I want to register for the draft. I want to work in a defense plant and I need to produce a birth certificate. And my name is different from what's on my birth certificate. Um, so we can clearly see this, the growth of bureaucracy here. But I want to say that bureaucracy is not the entire story. Um, just as in the 1920s and 30s, it was not the entire story. Um, uh, there is substantial and actually rising anti-Semitism during World War II. This might come as a surprise if you've seen a movie like Bataan uh, in the 1940s, right? Wartime propaganda emphasized the United States as a tolerant democracy. And it used, you know, in movies like Bataan uh, and, and a whole host of other platoon movies, right? They would introduce you to the platoon and every soldier would have a different name and there would always be a Jake Feinberg from Brooklyn, right? Um, there's always going to be somebody identified by a Jewish name and yet is a part of the troop and a part, you know, sort of represents the tolerance and the democracy of the American system. And that was actually like required by the Office of War Information. Um, so, and historians interestingly have kind of followed that pattern and sort of arguing that the, the experience of World War II and Jews experience as troops in World War II sort of exposed them to other, other people who might have been anti-Semitic and, and sort of broke down those prejudices and actually created bonds that, that, that actually forged the U.S. as a tolerant democracy. Um, and I would kind of argue that I think that the, 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 this image that I show you of these expanding name change petitions suggests that maybe that's, that's a, maybe not the case, that actually World War II actually sees a great deal of anti-Semitism that does affect Jews. So I use this poem. If you lived in America in the 1940s, you probably would have seen this poem somewhere. Defense magazine scrawled on a subway, sent home to you by a loved one. Um, the first American killed in Pearl Harbor, John J. Hennessy. And apologies for the racism here that is a part of this um, published poem. Um, first pilot to sink a Japanese ship, um, Colin P. Kelly. First American to sink a Japanese ship with a torpedo, John P. Buckley, first American air hero, Butch O'Hare, first American killed at Guadalcanal, John J. O'Brien, first American to get four new tires, Abraham Lucius. So sometimes when I give this in public, people laugh and it, it's supposed to be funny, right? But the humor is clearly at the Jews' expense, right? Jews are being stereotyped at this moment as war profiteers, people who refuse to fight and who got the United States into the war. And this is a pervasive belief that is being um, uh, circulated everywhere in the US, um, including in defense plants. Um, and so we can see um, the, the, the ways that this, these kinds of beliefs really have an impact on on soldiers and on Jews who are living during the United living during the war in the United States. So Solomon Goldfarb um, uh, changes his name to Saul Robert Guilford in 1942. And he says, I desire that he's getting married. Um, he explains, I desire that any offspring of my marriage shall not labor under the handicap of going through life with a name such as Goldfarb. This is an unfortunate situation of the world we live in, but it is a situation not of my making. And I feel that we must face reality. Um, so again, using veiled language, never actually really coming out and saying that they are experiencing anti-Semitism, but there are multiple um, uh, men who are soldiers um, who are going into the courts to change their name, not just because of bureaucracy, but because they are um, experiencing anti-Semitism in the troops. By the end of the war, by 1946, 
30% of the name changers are veterans and another 10% are their wives changing their names together, which means that 40% of all name change petitions in 1946 are World War II veterans, um, which I think gives us some insight into the, what people were truly facing um, in the troops um, in the United States, both men and women, I'll say. Um, name change petitions, I think, offer us uncomfortable evidence of the ways that ethnic differences, especially Jewish difference, um, really created so much prejudice during World War II that Americans worked to erase their differences entirely and shed any vestige of their background or past. So let me leave you with some conclusions. Um, Name changing was not an individual act outside of the American Jewish community. It was a communal act. It was something that Jews did together primarily as, as families, um, but also they are doing so in such phenomenal rates that fundamentally within the Jewish community, changing your name is, is a part, it is a communal act. It's not something that people do to escape the Jewish community. Um, name changing reflected Jewish upward mobility in the interwar years, but it also reflected rising anti-Semitism during the same era, an anti-Semitism that scholars don't always talk about or think about. Um, and this is particularly true with World War II, rather than alleviating anti-Semitism in the US, um, which some people sometimes believe, um, I, I would argue that World War II probably intensified it. Um, so um, thank you very much for your attention and your time. Um, and I look forward to hearing your questions and your comments. Um, and I think probably I'll stop the share. Actually, maybe I'll, I'll wait for, um, for the people running the show to tell me whether I should stop my share or whether I should keep it on. Great, yes, thank you very much for that. Um, I wanna remind our audience participating that you can submit questions for Dr. Vermeglish via the Q&A function. It's on the bottom of your Zoom webinar screen. Um, it's the two um, quote bubbles and we uh, should have time at the end for some of your questions. Um, can you say a little bit more about the reception of Jewish name changers within the American Jewish community at large. I was very surprised to read in your book that um, there were instances where Jewish judges were presiding over the um, name-changing cases of some of these applicants, and sometimes they would reject them outright, or they would scold them um, for trying to change their name. So I'm curious, how, how widespread was that pejorative attitude? Yeah, so actually, I think the the two examples in my book, they didn't reject them, but they did scold them. I think that they, there are, there are fewer cases of rejection, but yeah, there are, there are these pretty famous cases of, of being scolded, you know, um, especially when they actually shared a name. Like the, these were Jewish judges, and they actually shared the same name, right? And said, you know, no, you know, my I, I'm proof that you can have the name Goldstein and still be successful. Um, so yeah, I mean, a good portion of my book. So I just talked about sort of the rise of name changing in this talk, but I see my book more broadly as being about the rise and the politics and the fall of name changing and the politics of name changing, particularly after World War II. I would say during the era that I talked about right now in the 1930s and 40s, there's not as much kind of um, kind of there's not as much public opprobrium against people who change their names, I think, because it's kind of everybody's doing it right or not everybody's doing it. But there's there's a large sense that people are doing it and everybody knows why you're doing it because you, you can't get jobs right after World War II, I would say there's much more internal um, uh, um, battles, public. Those uh, probably the best thing to say is that there there are in, internal battles before the war, but they're more muted and they become much more open and much more public after the war. And so I have a chapter that looks at you know movies and and fiction um, and and you know just newspaper and magazine articles and pieces where you know there's a there's a lot of attacks on name changers. There's a lot of sense that they are betraying the Jewish community um, and that they uh, you know that they're they're leaving the Jewish community altogether. They're self hating. Um, you know there's there's a lot of anxiety about name changers and a lot of anger directed towards them. And you can see especially right after the war, like 40, 47, 48, really sort of substantial battles in like pages of magazines and film and stuff where, where, you know, people are really attacking Jews and some Jewish name changers are coming out and saying, no, you know, this is why I did it. So um, yeah, it causes a lot of internal rifts. And then there are stories, there are um, in memoirs, um, the famous Dr. Newland, Sherwin Newland talks about changing his name and, you know, a gym teacher 
pretending that he can never remember the new name, you know, always calling him by some other kind of, you know, name because he refuses to kind of accept this new name he's taken on. So I think there's also a lot of kind of internal stories as well, oral histories and things like that. Sometimes people will describe facing um, conflict. So I, I think that it created a, a good amount of, of conflict and distress within the Jewish community. Sure, sure. Um, let me ask you now about your research methodology. Tell us about going into um, the archives, finding this, you know, treasure trove of name change petitions, what that was like, highlights of that experience, and then maybe also a little bit about the other sources that you used um, in researching this book. Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was, I remember the week that I went to New York and for my exploratory research. Um, and, and I want to just thank the New York C City Civil Court um, uh, system for giving me access. So you can, and sometimes people ask me like, how do you, how do you find these name change petitions? I mean, it, it, they're not digitized and they're not in an actual archive. I actually had to go to the court. Um, so that's what I did. I went wandering around lower Manhattan, going to Supreme Court, going to different offices to try to see, because there are a number of different court, there, there are two different places where you could actually go officially and change your name. So, you know, and, and, they're set up to only look at individual name changes. So I had to get special permission. So I remember wandering in and this wonderful, I will re recognize him here, Ernesto Belzagai was this wonderful deputy clerk at the New York City Court who was interested in my work and asked me to give him a copy of the book when it was done. And he gave me access and it's not the kind of access anybody has. So I, for a long time, I actually got to just walk in and go where the clerks go and they gave me access and photocopying. And it was, it was really wonderful. I'll say that after, um, uh, Mr. Belzegai retired, I didn't get quite the access that I did. So for the last portion of my book, I actually, I stood, I mean, I did initially, I stood online with people changing their names, right? And it's a teeny tiny little vestibule, probably, I, you know, the office where you go to stand to get your name changes, I don't know, the size of my office here. I mean, you know, maybe, you know, maybe a little bigger than this, but it's a small office. And so I was, people wait online and then they wouldn't give me, at that point, they didn't give me a desk or anything. They just gave me access to the files. So I just set myself up in a corner and I stood on top of chairs to take my pictures. And um, it was, you know, people thought that I was working there because I looked like I knew what I was doing. So they'd ask me questions and I'd say, I don't know, I don't work here. So it was, it was, it was a crazy, crazy experience. And I'll say that it really, um, and again, I'm very grateful to the people at the New York City Civil Court for giving me the access they gave me because I, you can't get that elsewhere. Detroit wouldn't give it to me. Other, you know, people wouldn't necessarily give it to me. Um, and it also gave me insight into how hard it is to change your name, right? And kind of some of the indignities, right? That you have to stand online for a long time to get a name that, you know, really it just is the name you want, you know? Um, and so that actually, that shows up a little bit in my book in the last chapter, because I, I I felt like that experience actually gave me a lot of sympathy for the people who were changing their names and and some of the difficulty um, that that is created in, in doing so. So I'm really, I'm grateful on all hands for that experience. Um, yeah. I don't know if that answers the question. I'm sorry, there was a second part to the question. Sorry. Sure. Well, I there's a lot of interesting methodological questions um, at stake here. Um, I think one of the things that your book highlights is that not everybody who has a Jewish sounding name actually is Jewish. Um, and sometimes somebody like Julius Kaminsky can have a very Jewish sounding name and is not Jewish. So how did you go about... Um, finding Jewish name changers in these petitions. And of course, the, the huge period under consideration, there were thousands, tens of thousands of petitions. How did you go about creating a representative sample plan? Yeah, so I I um I didn't know I had never done this kind of I had never looked at materials like this. So I made it when I they let me into the room, you know, Ernesto Bell's a guy gave me permission and I flew back and they just took me into a room. It was like the Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know, like that room where you just get in the room and there's the boxes everywhere. That's what they took me into, right? And I thought, oh my God, I don't know how to do this. I made an emergency call to friends of mine in econ and in poli sci who know more about sampling. <laughs> and so I mean ultimately, so I I looked at every fifth year, so um, I with the sevens and the twos. So I because the file started in 1887, so I just did 1887, 1892, 1897, and I went all the way through. 1946 was the only year I looked at 
on its own, just because there were so many name changes then that I felt like I needed to do that. Um, and then I looked at one in 10 petitions. Um, so I didn't, so as it is, so, and that's a question people frequently ask me, like, can, I, I can't actually enumerate how many people change their name because of this, you know, because of the sampling, I can only guess at it, right, because of this. Um, and then in terms of finding out who's Jewish, yeah, I mean, I I don't know, right? These are, these are guesses. Um, I used, and I talk in my book about the distinctive Jewish name methodology, which if you're in the social sciences, you may have heard of. It actually developed during World War II, and I actually talk about it as being in some ways a, a product of the attention being placed on names at that time. But it's basically a, um, it's a, it's a sampling process where they kind of came up with 106 distinctive Jewish names, names that 20 Jews and 20 non-Jews in New York thought, you know, would identify who was Jewish, right? Names that, and it's actually hanging up over in my office right here. So, you know, it includes names like Cohen and Katz and Goldberg and Goldstein, um, and also some other ones that are maybe less common. It actually has an asterisk next to the ones that are most common. And then there's a complicated kind of method to sort of using that to figure out how many Jews are in a population. I didn't really do that. Um, but what I did do was anybody who had a name on that list, I marked them and their entire family as Jewish. Mm -hmm. I then also kind of went with the feel. I listened to the name Julius Kaminsky. Kaminsky's not on that list, but we know Julius was a name that a lot of Jews had. And Kaminsky certainly sounds like, you know, a Polish Jewish name. So when I heard both a first name and a last name, they had to match. If it had been Patrick Kaminsky, I would never have thought that I wouldn't have identified him as a Jew. But if the name, the first name and the last name matched, and also if the um all the other information. So this, the petitions have things like occupation, residence, you know, uh, place of birth, things like that. Um, and, you know, if that material kind of indicated that they were Jewish, I counted them as Jews. If any of it didn't match, I didn't count them as Jews. So if it was Julius Kaminsky, but he worked as a chauffeur, I wouldn't have counted him, right? But if he had been a tailor, I would have counted him, right? So, right, all all the information had to match, right? If they were, if, if Julius Kaminsky lived on the Lower East Side, worked as a tailor, and had been born in Russia, I counted him as a Jew, right? Um, and if not, not. Now, I probably made mistakes. People have pointed out to me on more than one occasion that I wouldn't have counted myself as a Jew. I don't have a Jewish typed first name, and I haven't undefinable kind of unusual name as a last Jew, as last name. I am Jewish, but I wouldn't have counted myself. So I think that for every Julius Kaminsky that I might have counted, right, if he had sort of all the statistics, I think for everyone who might have gotten, you know, every Catholic Julius Kaminsky who might have been counted as changing their name, I think I was pretty conservative. So I think it's more likely that I didn't count people as Jewish than that I did. Um, but that's that's how I did it. Right. Sure. We've got a, a lot of questions coming in from our viewing audience. Let me ask you a first one about gender. Yeah. What kind of disparity between um, uh, male name changers and female name changers did you find? You talked about how the impetus to um, get a better job, get a middle-class job, get an education was one of the driving forces, if not the primary driving force as to why Jews are petitioning to change their names. Was it primarily men doing it, or did you also find many, many women petitioning to change their names as well? It's a really, it's a great question. Um, and so I would say that in the beginning, so in the very earliest years, it is predominantly men, um, like 80% 80, 80 men. And that's like 1887, right? That's those earlier years. During the period that I spoke about today, what we see is increasing numbers of Jewish women doing so in families. Um, so, you know, it might be that the man is the one who needs to get the job, but it become, but, you know, women and their children increasingly come along. And sometimes, and actually frequently, women themselves are working, right? So Jewish women are actually working in the labor force much more. They're looking for white collar jobs at rates higher than other ethnic groups. Um, and so I was saying to um, someone that I, you know, I think actually that um, the fact that Jewish women are looking for jobs in the labor force in larger numbers for white collar jobs or pink collar jobs, secretaries and stenographers and typists like Dora Saryetsky that we spoke about earlier, 
I think that that actually helped to expand the numbers of Jews who are changing their names by 1942. So in 1917, 13% of the petitions are women. And by 1942, it's 34%, right? It has, it has more than doubled and it's become about a third. Women are about a third of the petitioners um, and children are 20%. So um, it becomes by, by the time that I'm speaking about, by the time, by the 1940s, Jewish women, just like Jewish men, are looking for jobs, and they're recognizing more and more the degree to which their families, their children need those need those change names, right, in order to be able to get into schools and get jobs. So, um, it and and something to think about that I think is really important is that Jewish women, single Jewish women, change their names to get jobs. They're going to change those names again as soon as they get married, right? That's their expectation and assumption, right? There, if you have a 24 year old typist who goes in to change her name, she's probably most likely expecting that she'll change it again in another five, six years, right? She'll, the assumption is she'll get married. So, really, Jewish women, Jewish children are experiencing the anti Semitism of the society and particularly of the labor force in, in much larger numbers as the time goes on. And so they just like men need to change their names and frequently do so either with their husbands or with their siblings. Yeah. Uh, the next question has to do with um, a correlation between um, changing one's name as a Jew and that individual's subsequent level of, of attachment or engagement with Judaism in the Jewish community. Um, and I know from reading your book that a lot of the vitriol directed at Jewish name changers by other Jews is this assumption that changing, changing your name is a kind of entry point into leaving the Jewish community, abandoning your Jewish identity. And you, you discuss that in your book. Can you say more about that? Yeah, no, that's definitely a belief, right? That if you're changing your name, you're you're moving out of the Jewish community, you're, you know, I, I, converting. And I, I will say that I did find a few petitions, maybe one or two a year of people. And remember, I'm not looking at every petition, but in my samples, I'm finding maybe one or two a year of people who are in fact converting or who have married um, somebody who's not Jewish. So I have, you know, a petition excuse me, from, you know, a man, I believe the name was Cohen, who talks about marrying, and the petition says, I have married a Catholic woman, we are raising our children Catholic, the name Cohen, <laughs> or whatever Jewish name it was, um, is 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 uh, not appropriate, I think, with the term, right, and so we are, you know, I'd like to change our names, so yeah, I see that, right, there, that's, it's not that that's not true, but there's many more examples, um, not so much in my files, I mean, my, my petitions don't tell this information, so I used other, I think you asked me before what other kinds of materials I used. So, and I forgot to answer that. I'm sorry. So um, I used other kinds of published materials, right? So I use articles and things like that. And then I found um, some unpublished. So there was a, um, a major, when I talked about sort of debates between name changers and non-name changers in the press, there's a big debate that goes on in the Atlantic. Um, and I look, there's a lot of unpublished letters to the editor um, about this. Um, and it includes, you know, um, uh, people who talk about changing their names and then say, I'm still Jewish, right? Like I'm still a member of the Jewish community. There's an article published in Commentary where 25 name changers are interviewed. And the, the name changers like really want to make clear to the journalist, no, I'm president of my synagogue. I'm still a Jew. Um, so I think that um, for most of these materials, my sense is that people change their names because they needed to for jobs or they felt they needed to for jobs for colleges but they imagine that that was just kind of their exterior right that's the that's the that's the image i'm going to give so that i can get this job so that i can you know function on a you know daily basis at work without people making assumptions about me without facing anti-semitism but what i do in my own home that's what I do. And I'm going to stay with my Jewish community. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, um, uh, you know, keep my Jewish, my family Jewish, you know, it doesn't at, from what I've seen for the most part, it doesn't indicate that people are leaving the Jewish community. And, and I didn't publish this in the book, but I can say that my research, when I started it, one of the places I was looking, um, was uh, synagogue records and Landsmannschaft records. I was looking at these very, very Jewish institutions, right? Places where people keep speaking Yiddish or places where people are, you know, synagogues where people are maintaining religion. And I looked at the membership records and 
there's clearly people who've changed their names there, including rabbis, <laughs> right? So, I mean, definitely there are, I mean, I remember seeing that with one and thinking, oh my goodness, right? Like, I mean, I think, and I think all of us know, I mean, I can think of the people who go to my synagogue, right? And, you know, people who have been, you know, major activists in Jewish communities. Um, and, you know, the, the name change, I think, for many, many people was something that they needed to do to get by. It was not, it didn't indicate kind of a larger uh, abandonment of Jewish life. Interesting. So to give the story a kind of a local Houston angle, the rabbi of Congregation Beth Israel at the turn of the 20th century and um, into the um, World War I and interwar years was a rabbi named Henry Barnstein. And he changed his last name from Barnstein to Barnston. Huh. And the reason that he gave is because Barnstein sounded too, quote unquote, German. Yes. And, and in the World War I years, right, with all of the kind of anti-German sentiment becoming popular in America, he didn't want to have what, what he claimed was a German sounding name. And that happens, I, that is something that I really wrestle with. And I think I talk about in the book, not so much in World War I, but in World War II, you see a lot of people sort of not saying that this is anti-Semitism, but that their name is German sounding. And in fact, I see it in the World War I petitions. The World War I petitions for me, they didn't have the full petitions, only the um, orders. So I couldn't always see the reasoning. But um, but absolutely, like there's so many people, so many J Jews with German names, right, who change their names. And there's very few people who, you know, they're changing names like Bernstein and, you know, other kinds of very Jewish sounding names. And nobody's changing names that is like, you know, Adolf. I'm, think I'm trying to think of like a very, you know, German name that doesn't sound Jewish. Those names are not being changed. And in fact, people are also changing names like Cohen and Katz and names that are that are distinctly Jewish, right? That that are, you know, relig religiously Jewish as well. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to insult anybody's rabbi. I actually feel bad about that. I don't want to, I don't want to cast aspersion of some as rabbi. No, of course not. Of course not. Um, so your book obviously tells a very New York-centric story. And that makes sense for a lot of reasons. New York was, um, during the decades that you study, the most Jewish city in the world. Um, and so it, it makes a lot of sense. But can you talk about the extent to which you became aware of other examples of Jewish name changing in other parts of the country, the Midwest, the South in particular? And if you think it was um, the similar phenomenon, if there were any important um, differences in, in terms of Jews living in smaller communities, small towns, non, you know, New York City locations doing similar things. Sorry. Yeah, sure. So, um, so I did, you know, I did my work in New York City. Um, I found um, in terms of how it relates elsewhere, there's two other studies that I think kind of verify or back up mostly what I've, what I've said. One study that was done in the late 40s in LA um, and another book that came out about Minneapolis, St. Paul in the 19s, early 1960s. Um, and they, they're not exactly the same as my work, but they're, they definitely indicate that it is kind of middle-class Jews that are doing the name changing in large numbers. Um, those are big cities. And I'll say that out of the other, mostly out of the unpublished materials that I described to you, letters to the editor, other places where I found a lot of unpublished correspondence, I see, and, and oral histories too, a lot of the references I see to name changing are in big cities and, and consistently all over the country. Um, uh, maybe a little bit less in the South, although I'm just kind of stretching to think of whether I, I have examples from Atlanta or um, more of the examples probably come from the Midwest. Um, but I would say, so So I, I, my sense is that what I found is mostly applicable to, um, to large cities, definitely West, Midwest, um, uh, and the Northeast. Um, in terms of the south, in terms of the south, it's interesting. What sticks in my head that I am thinking about is that. So I read a lot of pop fiction for this. I read a lot of middle brow fiction. There was a lot about name changing, right, in the late nineteen forties, um, just at this moment when it's becoming a big deal. And there is a novel that I think I cite in the book that is about a small town in the south where there's this big 
uh, I guess he's an, you know, he's a big businessman in this little tiny town in the South. And you find out at the very, very end that he changed his name, like that he's Jewish and he changed his name. And like, that's the kicking point of the whole, it's like the whole, it's that that's the big reveal at the end of the story. Um, so I think that the, the findings that I have, I would say definitely big city and, and more probably West, Northwest, Midwest, um, I, my guess is probably it made sense for some of the bigger cities, but I, the South may be its own thing. And I've actually given talks in places like Memphis went before, before the shutdown, I went to Memphis. Um, and I think I was in one other Southern community. I, I'm sure I was actually, I, uh, and I was just at UNC. I think there may be some slight differences in the South actually, but I, I, I can't speak to them because I haven't done that research. Um, and people in Memphis definitely suggest, oh, in Texas, I went to Dallas as well. Um, and the senses that I've got is that there is some, there, there might be some distinctions in Southern life that, that, that would be right for studying actually. So that, that's all I'll say. Sounds great. Well, we have time just, I think for one more question. And there was an audience question about the Ellis Island myth. And this obviously is a myth that I'm sure wherever you go talking about your book, talking about the subject of name changing, this you know, story obviously comes up and other people, uh, including Dara Horn, have written about it. So I'm curious why you think this Ellis Island narrative is so enduring. What does it say, you know, to your mind about American Jews that we have this idea that names were changed not you know not by us not of our own choice but changed for us by somebody by an immigration inspector at Ellis Island yeah i mean to me it's i read it as being a product of this battle that went on among Jews right and this sense among a lot of Jews that um you're betraying the Jewish community by changing your name, that there's something um, that is traitorous, treasonous, inauthentic, not Jewish about doing this, right? And so it's easier to say, we didn't do this, somebody else did this for us, right? This wasn't, this wasn't me, it's not my fault, I didn't, I didn't do this. Um, and I think it's also probably pretty painful to talk about anti-Semitism. I think that American Jews didn't wanna talk about that. I think that they, you can see even in the petitions, they, they don't, it's embarrassing, it's uncomfortable, it's humiliating, right, to say I, I couldn't get a job, right, like I think that people don't really want to talk about that, um, and so I think they, they feel embarrassed, and, and speaking to other Jews, right, who are angry at them, right, they, they, you know, they, they, they don't want to admit that they've changed their names, and they don't want to talk about the experiences that they faced um, that made them feel like they needed to change their names, um, so that is my sense. And I think that that's, I think that that's why people haven't spoken about it. I think that's, I, I think also people think about names as jokes, right? N names are, names just talk about who you are and nobody really thinks about them very deeply. Um, and I think that's, I hope that people will take this webinar and go forward and start to think about names seriously. Um, but I think that, you know, they're easy to kind of brush off, say it's not important. Um, but I think that they really do indicate for us a lot of the pain that people felt. And, and, and I think that too, it helps us to think differently about race in America, you know, um, you know, our thinking about race in America is very much about what you look like, right? Um, and I think it's really important to see other means of racializing people, other means of typing people as others, um, and thinking about the ways that Jews, even as they might have had white skin and had white privilege in the United States, their names marked them um, and, and led to led to more pain and more discrimination than I think we talk about a lot in, in American history. And so I think it's, yeah, I think, I think it's important to kind of think about that. And I think that's why I think people don't want to delve into that, which is what <laughs> the Ellis Island myth, I think is long lasting. And people then don't want to, I mean, you know, nobody wants to tell you that your grandparent told you a lie, you know? So I think also it's very hard to it's very hard to fight against that, um, you know, because nobody wants to sort of also say that their family stories were not true. I mean, I know Dara Horn talks about being yelled at in, in, you know, talks, and I have two, which is why I have a little disclaimer at the beginning of my presentation. Um, and I remember going out to dinner with friends when I first started this project, and one of my, our friends got very angry at me. You know, it's, these are things that are hard, they're hard to talk about. I think that's one reason. Yeah. Such an important conversation. I want to uh, thank you uh, so much to Dr. Fermeglish for uh, joining us today.
thank you to all of you who watched and sent in questions. Again, the book is um, A Rosenberg by Any Other Name, A History of Jewish Name Changing in America, uh, available wherever fine books are sold. I want to also thank our uh, core team of administrative support, uh, Chetna Cates, our Jewish Studies Program Coordinator, and John Waterhouse, Director of Communications for the School of Humanities at Rice. It's always a pleasure working with both of you. Please visit our website, jewishstudies.rice.edu, for more information about the program in Jewish Studies at Rice, as well as upcoming events. And you can also uh, look for us on Instagram, at Rice Jewish Studies, and on Facebook. Thanks again to Dr. Fermeglish for joining us today, and thanks to all of you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.